Well, good morning and welcome to South Point, where we're one church in multiple locations. I want to say good morning, Leonardtown. Is anyone excited to be here this morning? And I want to say good morning to our Lusby campus. Uh, we're just fired up. My name is Matt. I'm part of the team here. And hey, before we just even dive in, I want to say something because sometimes I think we forget. Hey, we have a couple of like, we have five kind of key core values here at South Point. Uh, the first one is Jesus is a big deal. Uh, but the second one is, is everyone is loved and welcome. And we have this little saying, and um, I start the new year off, and I just want to make sure that we remember at South Point, we really don't care why you're here uh, because South Point is a place where you can come as you are. And the good news is, is none of us have to stay that way. At South Point, we don't care where you've been because we believe the great news is God is more concerned about where you're going. And lastly, we don't care what's been done either by you or to you because we believe the greatest news in human history is my life, your life, and our life does not have to be defined by what we've done, instead by what Jesus already did on the cross and conquering hell and death. So if you only hear one thing this morning, we hope that you know that you matter deeply to God. So we're glad that you're here. Hey, we're actually in week three of a series called Double. And the reason that we name this series Double is because in life, it sometimes feels like there's two of us. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. And here's what I mean by there's two of us. There's a me I want to be. Raise your hand. Is there a me that you want to be? Is there a me that you picture and see? Yeah, there's a me I want to be. And then there's the me that I am. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said, oh, that's the me that I am, right? Like there's the me that I am. There's the me that I want to be. And there's often a gap or a difference in between the me I want to be and the me I am. And it's true for me. It's probably true for you. It's probably true for us that all of us have a me I want to be that we're not yet. Now listen, if you missed week one or two, I want to really encourage you, you can go to our website or you can go onto our YouTube channel. I suggest you subscribe because uh, each week you'll just get our videos from our messages and you can go on there and catch up from week one and week two. So, but here's what I want to do this morning. I want to kind of dive in early. So I'm going to ask you to kind of lean in a little bit. And here's why I want to dive in early because we're going to tackle something really hard today. And you might be thinking, why in the world should we want to tackle something that's really hard? And here's why we want to tackle something that's really hard. We want to tackle something that's hard because it's one of the most helpful things in life to us. And so here's what I'm going to ask. Even though it's hard, because it's one of the most helpful things, would you be willing to hang with me all the way to the end of the message, even if you hear some things you don't want to hear, even if you hear some things you go, I don't know if I bind it, if you just be willing to track for the whole message, I want to tackle something hard. And here's what I want to tackle. To become the me that I want to be, you and I have a hidden problem that we need to address. And if I was really honest, this hidden problem is something that very few people ever, ever really want to admit or even want to talk about. Matter of fact, this hidden problem has become such a big problem, it's actually made national headlines across the country. Matter of fact, this hidden problem by some experts is called an epidemic in America and maybe in most of the modern countries has become this epidemic among us. Matter of fact, CBS News did an article after they did some research, they had seen some of these things going on. And here's what we're gonna see where CBS puts it up here. It says 72% of Americans experience loneliness and that is uh, October of 2016. 72%, you know what that means? If you're sitting in a row with seven people, look, 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 look around you. If you're sitting in a row with seven people, that means five of them have experienced loneliness. Now, here's where I want to ask you to listen. Listen, some of you are like, up, oh, I'm done. I'm mentally checking out. I'm not lonely. I don't have this problem. I'm good. I have lots of people. In my so listen, before you mentally check out, I'm going to ask that you just, just stay with me because I have some facts and things I want to go over. And here's the first one. Our definition of loneliness is somewhat messed up because here's what we say. Well, how could 72% of Americans be experienced loneliness? I mean, don't they have a mom or dad? Don't they have a sibling? Um, aren't they married? Aren't a lot of people married? Don't they have kids? And the answer is yes. But here's what you know. Here's what I know. I bet here's what we know. Listen, just because you have a mom or dad doesn't mean that you don't feel lonely. Do you remember middle school or high school? You may have had the best parent. Come on, smile. Some of y'all remember. I know you hate maybe middle school, but come on, smile. You remember middle school and high school, right? You said, yes, my parents. I had both of them. They both loved me. But you didn't go to school and say, my parents are my best friends. I feel so filled up. Because you knew in middle school and high school, you needed more relationships than just your mom or your dad. Listen, you may be married. And listen, if you've been married over seven days, you know you can be married and still be lonely. Can I get an amen? Listen, if you're here and you're single and you think getting married is going to solve your loneliness problem, woo, you better solve it before. 
I mean, the reality is, is you can be married and you can be lonely. There's, there's nothing wrong with your spouse. There may be nothing wrong with your marriage. But the reality is, listen, you may be here and you may be a parent. You may be a parent and you may have kids. And you think, listen, because I have kids, I'm not lonely. Listen, if you have little kids, you want some adult conversation. Right, and here, here's what social, here's what social, like this isn't is a religious idea, this isn't a mad idea. Here's what they've said socially is that you and I need relationships outside of our immediate family. That a spouse, a child, a sibling, and a parent, while that's good and it's needed, it is not enough that you and I need relationships outside of that. And that's where 72% of Americans feel lonely. And it wasn't just CBS USA Today wrote this. They had done an article and done some research in, in April of last year. They said the prevalence of loneliness is surprisingly high, 72%. I bet if you took a survey that would absolutely mirror us, if you said, hey, in the last six months, have you felt lonely? The prevalence of loneliness is surprisingly high, says John, I can't pronounce his last name, director of the Center for Cognitive and Social Neuroscience at the University of Chicago. I mean, this is a bright dude. He spends his lifetime doing this and he says, listen, you'd be surprised this concept of loneliness is surprisingly high because we think just because someone has a parent in life or someone has a spouse in life or someone has kids that somehow they're not lonely. Matter of fact, the American Association of, of, um, uh, of Psychology, they got together and then the Science News reported their findings just this past August. This is five months ago. Here's what they said. Loneliness and social isolation may be, represent a greater public health hazard than obesity, and their impact has been growing and will continue to grow according to the research. So this isn't my idea. This isn't some religious idea. These are, these are people outside of the faith who have been doing research and discovered there's a social isolation, a loneliness problem that is on epidemic here in America. And I know what you're thinking, because this is what I thought. I, I thought, listen, come on, Matt, how can that be? My life is more crowded than ever before. Can I get an amen? Especially if it's nose in St. Mary's. All right? I mean, my life is crowded more than ever before. Now, here's what I want you to kind of lean in and look, look. Listen, just because you're a part of a crowd doesn't mean you're connected. Let me say it again. Just because you're a part of a crowd doesn't mean... You're connected, and, and this is where it gets a little bit hard. Listen, you, you may have a ton of friends on your Facebook. You may have lots of followers on Instagram. You may have many coworkers. You may have lots of classmates. You may have a neighborhood full of people that you know. But here's what we do know. The number of relationships to the number of people we know isn't what matters. It's the depths of the relationships we have with the number of people that we do know. It's the quality. Which leads us to a truth this morning that, like, like you know this, I know this, but we never really want to say it out loud. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of put it up on the screen here. It says, listen, being around people is not the same as being with people. Like, like, listen, you can show up to church and you can kind of smile, you can shake a hand, you can say your name, right? You can check your kid in and you can leave and you are around people, but that wasn't the same as being with people. And I think this is what social science is telling us, is we're around lots of people, but we're really not with anyone. We have no deep and meaningful connections as part of our life, and so we're socially isolated. Now, here's an important question. Pastor Matt, why does this matter? What is so important? Why is this connected to becoming the me that I want to be? That like, I need to not be socially isolated. I need to not experience relationship. And here's why, because here's the truth that the Bible says that you experience, even if you're of different faith or you have no faith, you probably believe and understand this to be true. And here's what it is. We're going to put it up on the screen. It says, God often shows up. God is present or shows up in our lives through other I mean, think about it. Have you ever meant this, have ever said this phrase, oh, you're a godsend? Maybe your car broke down on the side of the road and someone pulled up and helped you push it out of the middle of the way and said, thank you, you're, you're a godsend. Maybe you're in a job or a career and you were in over your head, but there was a coworker who came alongside of you and mentored you and you said, thank you, you're a god. Maybe you were in high school and it was a class or you were on a team and, and you weren't fitting in and things weren't going well and someone kind of took you in and introduced you into the social group and you said, they are a god. And you don't want to know why? It's because God often shows up in our lives through people. Listen, I've been following Jesus since I was 18, and sometimes very poorly. 
am I the only one that's ever been a bad follower of Jesus here? Like, I've needed lots of grace through my years, right? I've been following Jesus for a little long time. And like, listen, listen. And and I'm a pastor. I love Jesus. I've been in full-time ministry for a long time. And listen, I I just want to have a little bit of confession here. Listen, I've never, ever heard the audible voice of God. I've never heard God like, just like, like, just, you know, I've heard him in my heart. I've heard him through other people, but I've never actually heard his audible voice. I've never, to, to the best of my knowledge, I've never had an angelic visit. Like, I've never, like, been terrified, ever seen a winged man. Like, n- never had that. Matter of fact, I've had some crazy dreams, but I can't, I can't really say that I've had a dream that I go, God showed up on your name. But here's what I can say, that God has regularly showed up in my life through people. True, true story. True story. And one of the most difficult times in my life, my wife and I, we had just had our second child. I was still on Young Life Staff, which is a great organization that works with middle school and high school students, right? But I didn't make a lot of money. I bet I made under $30,000. And I had been driving on my way on a Sunday to go pick up stuff because I was having about 60 high schoolers in my basement. And I was going to pick up stuff to have them over, snacks and drinks, right? Because that's what my part of my job was, to love high school and middle school students, right? And on my way back home, a high, high school student that I didn't know crossed the double lane, hit me head on, and totaled my van. And when I got my insurance money, which wasn't a lot, I mean, it was probably $3,000 or under, and I had this idea, maybe, listen, I should be wise. I won't spend my money on a new car because I have two kids. Listen, you can put flames on a minivan, but it's not cool, right? And so I realized I should be wise with my money. I'm just going to go get another hoopty, and that way I can save. And I went and bought a car, but I bought a car from someone who I thought was trustworthy, but they sold me something that was defective. Matter of fact, the mount to the transmission, they had rebuilt the engine incorrectly. It would never stay in, and I tried to have it fixed six times. And so after a couple weeks of this, a couple months of this, I literally had no vehicle and I had spent all my savings trying to fix it. And I can remember, I got a wife with two little babies who have to be able to go places. And I'm on a ministry staff and I don't make a lot of money. I've spent all my money and I have my hands on my head at the table going, God, what do I do? God, I need you to show up. I tried to do the right thing. What do I do? And I don't know if it was a week. It felt like the next day. My wife and I got a letter in the mail from her sister. Now, her sister had done fairly well. They, she had, they had bought an old house. They had fixed it up, and they sold it. They made a lot of money. Um, and they knew that we were on this ministry job and the staff, and they had never really given to us, but they just felt led for some reason after they sold their house to give us some of the money of the proceeds, and they sent us this check, and this check was enough for me to go get a car. And here's what I discovered. God often shows up through, no, 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 no. Through what? I mean, think about it. When you read the Bible throughout all of history, when God has shown up in history, God has always shown up in history through people. I mean, think about it. When we think about Jesus, Jesus is God showing up as a person. Now, here's the thing. If we are socially isolated and lonely... But God uses people to show up in our life, but we don't have people that God can use to show up in our life. We have this hidden problem, which leads us to a truth this morning. Now we can switch the slide that says this. Being disengaged relationally can disconnect us spiritually. Being disengaged relationally can disconnect us spiritually. See, when you and I go around life blocking out people and blocking out relationships, going, I don't have time, I'm too busy, I'm too this, people hurt me, you know, I, don't, I, just, need, I just need me and God, and, and we block people out relationally, that's okay, but as we block people out relationally, we also block out opportunities for God to show up in our lives. Because God often works through people to help you and I with encouragement. God often works through people to help you and I with with advice. God often uses people in our lives to help us to listen. God often uses people in our lives to correct us when we get off path. God often works through people to provide a mentor so that we can know what to do. If you and I choose to disengage relationally, 
you and I are choosing to disconnect somewhat spiritually because we're limiting the amount of opportunities that God could be present in our lives. And if we want to become the me I want to be, we need God to be present. And here's the good news this morning. is that you and I are not the first people to deal with this. Matter of fact, just because social scientists figured this out, listen, God knew this would be a struggle that every generation would deal with. And matter of fact, in the early church, there was a church in Jerusalem, and it was mostly made up um, of, of Jewish Christians. Um, and there was an author, and we think it's Paul. We don't know for sure if it's Paul. It's the same guy that we wrote Romans that said, hey, listen, I find this principle that when I want to do right, I often do wrong. And we talked about that the last couple weeks. And he writes to this church. He writes to this church in Jerusalem, and he writes these words. We're going to see it's in Hebrews, right? We're going to put it up there, Hebrews 10, 22. And he says, so let us come near to God with a sincere heart. So he's saying, listen, if you want to become the you that you want, to be, you need to come close to God because you don't have the power to be the you we are. You and I have these default settings, me, myself, and I, that keep us from becoming the me we want to be, right? So let us come near to God with a sincere heart. Let us come boldly because of our faith. And here's the great news. Remember that gap between the me I want to be and the me I am? Jesus made that up so you and I can come near boldly because Jesus has covered the gap. So this author is telling Christians, listen, you and I need to come near to God. We need God to be present in our life. We need God's presence because it's the only way we'll have the power to become who we're meant to be. And then literally a verse later, the author is going to describe to you and I how we can come near to God. Listen, in verse 24, he says this, let I, or me, consider how I can stir myself up to love. Let me help myself to do good works. And let us not me, oh, I read, I think I read that wrong. What it says, let, okay, not complicated, it's not a trick question. <laughs> let us consider how we can stir one another to love. Let, help one another to do good works and let not give up meeting together. Two times, a matter of fact, within one sentence there says, one another, one another, meet together. Do you see a pattern here? That if we want to draw near to God, if we want to have God present in our life, there needs to be something not a me, but there needs to be a we. We need to move from me to we. He continues to say, some are in the habit of doing this. What are in the habit of doing? They're in the habit of giving up meeting together. He says, instead of you know, just not meeting together. He says, let us encourage, and there's that word again, one another with words of hope. Let us do this even more as you see Christ's return approaching. So here we have God speaking to a group of Jewish followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. And he says to them, listen, if you want God to be present in your life, if you want God to be near as you draw near to him, how are you going to do that? He says, don't give up meeting together. You need to be around some one another's. Listen, in part, it's a big part, but it's not the only part, but it's a big part of God being present in our life is when you and I choose to relationally connect with other people who are also following Jesus. But here's what I discovered. That is easy to say. And most people will kind of nod their head. They'll go, I get that. I get that, that, you know, that we're better as a team and that, you know, that like I should have one another and that like doing life by myself, even if I have a, even if I have a mom or dad, even if I have a sibling or even if I have a spouse, like I should have other people in my life that I can encourage and that they encourage me. Like that's wisdom. That makes sense. You know, I don't need to be like, that, 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 that's kind of common knowledge. Like, but here's reality. There's four obstacles that we all have to overcome for us to be willing to relationally engage so that we can be spiritually connected. And so this morning, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. I just wanted to briefly, and I know whenever a preacher says briefly, um, you don't trust them, but I promise you it'll be briefly because the timer tells me I have to be brief, right? But there are four obstacles that we all have to overcome so that we can be relationally engaged. And here's obstacle number one is we go, sometimes our pride gets in the way. Can I get, see, no one likes that one. I told you this was hard, didn't I? I told you in the beginning, hang in with me. You're going to hear some things you don't want to hear, is that sometimes our pride gets in the way. And you know, here's where pride gets in the way. I don't need anybody. Am I the only one that's ever thought that? 
I mean, how many times have you thought, listen, with my relationship with God, I really don't need anybody. It's just me and God. I don't need, I don't need a church. I don't need a pastor. I don't need to be in a small group. I don't need to be in a group where I'm talking to other people the same sex about real problems and, you know, where I'm kind of being accountable and open and can get encouraged. Like, I don't need that. It's, I'm good. But here's the question that I have for you. Jesus never did that. And so here's where I get it. If you're here and you have no faith or different faith, I could get why, why you wouldn't want to meet with other people. But even Jesus, and I would suggest to people who have no faith or different faith, that if you look to Jesus and see him as someone who is a great role model, Jesus himself was relationally engaged. He had the three, his BFS, his best friends forever. He had, he had Peter, James, and John. And then there were the 12 apostles, and then he had the 72 followers. Jesus was the only human in history that could have lived the life by himself because he was connected to God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son. He was already in community, yet Jesus didn't choose to, to do life by himself. And so I just want to ask you this morning, if Jesus chose not to do life by himself and you're here and you claim to be a follower of Jesus, why would you try and choose to do life by yourself? Because here's what I discovered. Pride robs us. It robs other people of the things that gifts and the talents and experiences we have, and it robs us of the experiences and talent and the things that other people could bring into our life. And for many people, maybe, maybe you're here, maybe this is you, maybe you're that Christian that goes, listen, it's just me and Jesus and it's good and I'm all good. And, I, and the last time I checked, you following Jesus wasn't all about you. That maybe being connected in a group or maybe being involved somewhere where you were relationally engaged was about you bringing your ears to listen to someone. Maybe it was about you bringing your words of encouragement to someone. Maybe it was you bringing your story of transparency and brokenness so someone else who was broken and experienced that could know that they weren't the only one. What if you maybe don't need it, but maybe if someone else needs it and God wanted to use you, but you're, you're relationally disengaged. I love what the scripture says. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, as he writes to this church in Rome, there's a bunch of mixed people there, and he says this could be a problem, and he says this, he says this, he says, for the, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. You see, you know who the easiest person in all the world to fool is? Ourselves. I mean, I mean, that's why we need to be around other people because we can often fool ourselves so easy and say, well, that's not a problem or I'm great at this or look at me. And like we can easily fool ourselves. And so listen, he says, listen, you shouldn't think more highly of yourselves than you should. And then he goes on to say this. He says, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment, which means there's the me I want to be and there's the me I am and they are often different. I should get around some other people heading in the dire same direction so God can be present so I can become the me I was meant to be in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. But then he goes on to say this, for just as each of us has one body with many members, I have a hand, I have a foot, I have an eye, I have an ear. Even though these members do not have the same function, so in Christ, though we many form one body, each member belongs to... If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, you are not your own. You belong to a family that you're supposed to be a part of. But for many of us, we allow pride. I don't need anyone, but there's the flip side of pride. I don't want anyone to see how busted and broken I am. Right? Like, I don't want to go somewhere, and then someone might see me for who I really am, and then they'll think less of me. Well, listen, I just want you to know, we already know you're broken. And you want to know why we know that? It's because all of us are. There are new perfect people. We're all just people trying to follow Jesus. When I was a young kid, um, before um, I was locked up, I was young, uh, gosh, probably seven, eight. Um, my biological dad and my stepmom, they moved, and we moved from an apartment uh, to a townhouse. And I can remember my uncle came over, and I looked up to my uncle. My uncle was this big dude, kind of like a biker dude, like just, just awesome. I mean, just when I thought of a guy, I thought of my uncle. And I mean, he has his own issues, but he came to help us move. And I remember I wanted to impress my uncle because he was just this, like, this manly dude and awesome. And I mean, I've just always been scrawny and skinny. I eat a lot of food. I work out. I know I should get my money back. I'm sorry. But if you, 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 I was skinny and scrawny, but I remember I wanted to impress my uncle. So as we were moving, I remember we were moving this piece of thing, and my uncle needed someone to help. And I ran over and said, I got you, Uncle. I'll help you. And he says, no, 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 no. This is too heavy. And I said, no, no, no. I got this. Watch me. And you know, I had those bony arms. And you know, you try to flex. And then they go in the opposite direction, right? And so I said, I got it, Uncle. And he said, no, you don't. And I said, yes, I do. He said, okay. 
You know, he's like, all right, if you want to make a fool of yourself, go ahead. And I was like, I got it, I got it. So I ran over there and I had a bowl haircut and my big ears sticking out and I get it over there. And I grab a hold of this thing and I'm picking and I can barely hold it and it hurts every part of me. I think I broke my back. And I remember as we're lugging this thing down the like little U-Haul and up the stairs, I, I'm like, literally, I just feel this sharp pain like I'm getting stabbed in my stomach. And then we put it down. And he says, he says, good job. And then like, I thought I was gonna get more for that. And then like the rest of the day, I was holding over and I had this sharp pain. Um, and a little bit later, I discovered I had a hernia because I ripped the lining of the wall of something because I was straining so hard. And if I had just not been prideful, because pride usually ends up harming ourselves. And sometimes our pride keeps us from being relationally connected because either we think we don't need them or they don't need us. But that's not what God has to say about it. Now, here's the second obstacle, and the second obstacle is this, is the priority. Sometimes our priorities are misaligned. Sometimes our priorities are misaligned. And now this one, man, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get some hate mail. Like, I get it. Like, I don't like it when I say it. I didn't like it when I read it. I just, like, this is going to be, like, really, like, so I'm so sorry. Like, but listen, listen, come on, come on. Everyone look up here. I get this all the time. I don't have time for small groups. Sometimes I don't have time for church. And I'll go, why? Well, you know, we have, we have this game. We, we have this sport. I, I have this hobby. You know, we're going there and we're going there. And, and, and I get that. And that's okay. You don't have to show up to church every day. You don't have to be a part of everything. Like, you, you should have a life and you should have free time. But here's what I'm always amazed. Even if you have no faith, different faith, or, or some faith, listen, you and I get this. That if we really, really want to be a better spouse, if you and I really want to be the best parent, if you and I really, really want to be the best employee, if you and I want to be a good boss, if you and I really want to be a great friend, what's the way to become the best spouse, the best parent, the best worker, the best boss, the best friend? Would be to have God present in your life because if God is present in your life, then you'll be great at those things. But for many of us, our priorities are not making sure God is present in our life. We just decide, listen, I want God to be present, but then I'm not going to do the things that allow him to be present relationally so he can show up. Now, I'm going to give you a kind of, oh, no one's cheering, no one's applauding, no one's smiling right now. Everyone's like, I hate you, <laughs> right? But like, listen, come on, listen, have you, I like, listen, this past uh, um, November, I flew on a plane and I flew on this plane and these people did not look happy and they did their standard, you know, like your belt buckle, go. I'm telling you, this, this person looked dead. Like, I, I didn't know if they were a zombie. It was the zombie apocalypse. You know, just like, she had no smoke of voice. I'm so glad you're here. Click. Uh. And she had no smile. And you tried to make on contact. And she looked everywhere. Pull out your thing. There's exit signs. Here, 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 there. And they did so fast. And, you know, if the plane blows up and the oxygen mask throws off, you know, stick your head between your legs and kiss your tail goodbye. <laughs> she didn't say that. But anyway, um, as part of this like airplane thing, um, they tell you that if there's some kind of like cabin pressure, an oxygen mask will drop. And that if you're traveling with family or kids, you should always put the oxygen mask on other people before yourself. No, you're right. They always say put it on yourself so that you don't become dysfunctional because if you're dysfunctional, you can't. Now listen, we laugh at that, but I wonder how many of us do that when we want God to be present in our life through having healthy relationships, then we say, no, I'm not going to be in healthy relationships, realizing it's the oxygen that fills our souls. So that now that we can be functional parents, now we can be functional spouses, now we can be functional friends and bosses and employees, Christ followers ought to be the best of that, by the way. That's a whole nother sermon. But the best bosses, the best employees, the best friends, the best marriages, the best spouses should be people who follow Jesus because he says, listen, do unto others in everything as you'd want done. We should make the best, not the worst. So I wonder, sometimes our priorities are misaligned that we just don't make time. Now, I want to say there's a little bit of caveat here, like single parents, man. Single parents, you got it tough. And there may be seasons, not a lifetime, but there may be seasons as a single parent where it's really difficult for you to like be in a small group. Maybe, maybe church is your thing. Maybe you have to serve, you know, but there are parent groups, right? And sometimes I call it scarcely new baby syndrome. Like if you got a brand new baby, like, and you're a new parent, like I get it, that's a tough season, you know, but don't let that season become a lifetime. And then sometimes there's sickness or injury and like you're just in a place where you can't be around people. And so there's a little bit of caveat and there's some grace there. But if those aren't you or you kind of pass that scarcely new 
where you have a little bit of margin. Listen, I discovered we make time for whatever is important. Think about all the Netflix time you watched if you connected with people relationally. Uh, that one hurts. I'm going to go on from there so no one hates me, right? Which leads me to ob uh, obstacle number three, which is this. Sometimes pleasure will deceive us. Sometimes pleasure will deceive us. And here, here's what I mean by sometimes pleasure will deceive us. Is listen, listen, life is busy. We're working. We're going to school. We're doing all these things. We know we should be relationally connected. We know we want more than our brother or sister to like us. We know we want more than our mom or dad to like us or our spouse to like us. We know we want to be relationally connected with other people so God can be present in our life. But when that doesn't happen, there's this kind of hole. There's this kind of emptiness that we feel. And so we try to fill it. And here's the problem with pleasure. Pleasure is always temporary and it always subtracts. It always subtracts. It never adds. You are always less at the end of it. I mean, think about it. Did you, anybody remember high school? Some of us were in high school. Some of us, we remember it because it was like a year ago. And some of us were trying to remember what it was like before computers and the internet, right? We had the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? right? It was our homework, right? Remember that? Do you ever remember having a test? And you had two choices before your test. You could study, which was painful and hard, but it would help you get an A. Or you could procrastinate. You could watch TV. You could go on your phone. You can go on Facebook. And you know what? It feels so good. It feels better in the moment to procrastinate, but it subtracts and leaves you in a hole later. And I think for many of us, when we're relationally or socially isolated, we fill our lives with pleasure, whether it be food or, or pornography or, or whatever it is, or spending or entertainment. We try to fill our hearts and our souls with that, but the problem is it, it's only temporary and it leaves us in a more deficit. And so now we've got to go back to the same thing and that's how we become addicted. Pleasure will deceive us, which leads me to observation number four. The timer's telling me I'm almost done. Sometimes pain will distract us. I like how Pastor Tyrone said this. He called it old girlfriend syndrome. <laughs> old go girlfriend syndrome or old boyfriend syndrome. It's where like someone hurts you had someone hurt you, they did something wrong and, and maybe they lied to you, maybe they cheated to you, maybe they talked bad about your, behind your back, maybe they abandoned you, uh, maybe they disappointed you, maybe they weren't loyal. I don't know what it is that they did to you, but the problem is, is when that relationship ends, you take that dysfunction and that hurt that they did to you and you take it into your next relationship and you start to put what they did onto somebody else and then that relationship fails. Now you got some more hurt and some more damage and then you carry that next thing and here's what happens. When you let past pain cause present pain, it is insanity. And if we're really honest, sometimes the pain of a bad friendship or a bad relationship keeps us from being willing to step into healthy relationships. You see, that's why our number four value at South Point is this, is that life is better. Okay, can you say it like we mean it? Life is better. Life is better. When we do life together, it's better. We become more. We become more because we're around people who love us, encourage us, but will also tell us the truth and will be honest and we can see ourselves. It's just a much better. We become more and we can do more when we're connected in genuine relationships with others. And there's not a person in this room that probably disagrees with this in their mind, but I want to ask the question, how many of us are practicing this? I mean, maybe you're married. That's great. Maybe you got kids, that's great. Maybe you got a mom or a dad that you talk to, that's great. But outside of your immediate family relationships, where do you have meaningful friendships with others who are going in the same direction, who could be God present in your life and help you to become the me you want to be? I was trying to think about how to end this thing. And so I'm going to end the message with a really, really bad joke. Okay, so everyone smile. Everyone already be aware that it's going to be a bad joke, okay? So I told you ahead of time that this is going to be a bad joke. It's not going to be overly funny. You're going to go, oh, that was a dud. I see why that's bad. Okay, so the joke starts off. There was this town, right? And this town was on the water. And this town had a fairly large church. And in this church, there was one person who loved God, loved Jesus, went to church all the time, right? But this little town had a problem. It was near the water. And one time, this big storm came. It was like a hurricane, and it rained, and the water's flooded, and the town was flooding. And this person, they got stuck in their house because the flood water's already starting to come and, and their car they couldn't get out and so this person said God I pray that you will help me and so they grab their cat and they grab a few pictures and they go up to the roof it's just them and they're on the roof and all of a sudden this monster four-wheel jeep you know one of those guys is like oh I love my jeep and it's got all the wheels in it and it's like drives out the water and then sees this person on the roof and they stop and they said hey do you need a ride I can get you out of the flood 
And the person yells down from the roof, no thanks, God is coming to save me. They shake their head and go, okay. And and they go on and they rescue a bunch of other people. Well, a couple hours passes. Now the floodwaters have risen risen past just through the door up to about the windows. And there's this boat. There's this boat going through. You know, there's a boater in the community. And they used their boat. And they were going around trying to rescue people. And so the boat sees this person up on the roof. And they cry out, hey, won't you save you and your cat and your stuff? Get in our boat. And the person yells, no, it's okay. Don't worry about it. God's going to save me. And they shake their head. And they go on. And finally, the water gets near the roof line a couple hours later. And then a helicopter, one of those like rescue helicopters from like the Navy or the Coast Guard. And they're using the loudspeaker. We can see you over there. We're coming to rescue you. We can save you. And the person tries to yell, no, thank you. No, thank you. God's going to save me. And the person on the helicopter shakes their head and they fly off. Well, the floodwaters, you can guess what happens, right? The floodwaters cover the house, the person and the cat drown. And so there's the person at the pearly gates with the cat. Meow, kitty, 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 right? Petting the cat around. And as they enter the pearly gates and as they see God, they go, God, I thought you were going to save me. I prayed and I believed in you. Why didn't you save me? And then God just shook his head and said, I tried. I sent you a person in a Jeep. I sent a person with a boat. I sent you a helicopter. What were you thinking? Now listen, all of us look at that. See, I told you it was a bad joke. (laughs) Now we all laugh. And we all see the stupidity of that joke. But I wonder how many of us in our marriages are crying out for help. I wonder how many of us in our careers are crying out for help. I wonder how many of us have a hidden addiction that we're crying out for help. I wonder how many of us have a hurt or a pain or a habit we're crying out for help. And someone invited you to a small group or to celebrate recovery or to church. And God is trying to use people so that he can be present in your life. And we're shaking our heads saying, nope. God's going to save me. What if, what if God being present to meet us in those is through other people? Maybe if we get engaged with some healthy relationships, God can be present so that we can become the me I want to be. So I have one, just one simple challenge. We have our small group connect today. And I want to ask you to commit. I want to ask you, regardless of what circumstances, to commit for just six weeks. I mean, it's just six weeks. And out of the six weeks, you'll probably only make it four because the car will break down or something will go wrong. You have a bad evening. That's okay. But if you make four out of six weeks in a small group, just experiment. And if it doesn't work and you don't like it and and God doesn't show up, then fine. But would you commit for six weeks to trying a small group? Every person, would you commit? Because when you're engaged relationally, you can grow spiritually because our social life impacts our spiritual life we're called to be relationally connected hey let me pray heavenly father i've been on a rooftop before and asking you to rescue me and god has been amazing how many times you sent people in my life to help me get off the top of the roof god i believe today that there are people who are sitting on the top of the roof needing to be rescued God, I hope they hear your voice. I hope that they see that being connected relationally in small groups is you showing up to help them become the me that they want to be. Thank you, God, that there's grace no matter why we're here today. Thank you that's grace that no matter where we've been, God, thank you that there's grace no matter what we've done, that there's grace found not in a religion or a pastor or a church or a politics or a country or finances or a language, but in a person named Jesus. God, help us to see him in others and to be him for others. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.